Um, so, speaking of heat, we, today we have Dr. <laughs> Alfred Berger here with us today. Um, as you know, he's one of our colleagues down at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. He's a senior associate program director of residency down there, and also the site director for the Southern Chiefship. Uh, he trained at the Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia, and was also the chief resident there. Among his many roles, uh, he has many in the both regional and national societies. Uh, he's been a member of the Academic Hospital Task Force at SGIM for the past 10 years. He is also faculty for the annual UMP course in QI at uh, SGM. And in SHM, he is the chair of the Digital Learning Committee and a, member of, and a member of the Education Committee, as well as secretary for the local and IC chapter. Uh, is it, that's not enough. Uh, he's also busy uh, currently pursuing his master's in healthcare delivery. Um, and so a lot on his plate right now. Um, but first, he's had time to come here and uh, give us an update in hospital medicine. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, we can keep this very informal. You may have questions as we go along. There are a couple of spots that if uh, you, we want to have some open discussion before we get to a few break points where it's meant for questions anyway. So there's plenty of uh, raise your hand if you don't like how something was presented. Some of you may have presented these articles yourself for various things, uh, journal clubs, faculty precepting a resident journal club, just done them on your team. If you feel that uh, I went a little fast, I probably did. Um, but feel free to, to slow us down if you think there's something more important. This talk is adapted from a talk I give every year with uh, Brad Sharp from UCSF at uh, the Estrem National Meeting. So it is not as up to date as yesterday. Um, probably a couple of things I read in the Times this morning that I would have updated it to, but uh, didn't have quite enough time this morning. So um, why is it important to, to go to updates, whether it's here, whether it's at SHM or SGM or any other meeting? Um, so we all like to think there's you know lots of time. We all get annals or some other journal in our mail. It's JHM. We're going to read it all. But then there are the other conflicts. You know, got to relax on Monday nights, watch the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Harry Potter, Cursed Child. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. I did take my son. It was amazing. He loved it. Um, for big children and old children, some guy was talking to us with his college-age daughter, telling us how it was amazing and how he read the books with her as a little kid. So a lot of fun. Um, Yankee season, for those that are Mets fans, too bad. Um, it's Yankee season. Or uh, just the news, you know. Um, I'll stay out of that, but it can occupy a lot of your time. And then family, friends, whatever sort of relationship you want to take this to be. Um, you know, a lot of conflict in life. So we're going to go over things uh, from March 2017 to March 2018. That was sort of the scope of this literature search, as I said, sort of originally given at the national meeting. Um, I think they're all still very valid. None of them have really gone out of date, and um, they're important articles. Uh, the process, there's a CME collaborative review of journals, um, including, you know, what journals are reviewing as important things. Um, independent of analysis by the Consortium on Article Quality. Um, these are some of the people involved, as well as Brad Sharp, who was um, my co-presenter, but he doesn't get thanked on this slide. Um, articles are based on three main criteria. Will it change your practice in teaching, modify your practice or teaching, or just confirm your, your practice or teaching? So these are very clinical articles, um, things that we think are interesting and uh, something to, to make you think. Again, there's going to be a lot of them. We're going to go quick. So I hope not to use the word student t-test, meta regression, <laughs> mental Hansel, statistical method in any form. Um, we're going to focus on breath. Not depth. As I said, some of you may know some of these articles a little better. We're going to keep them kind of quick. Uh, we're going to do major reviews and short takes. It's going to be case-based, multiple choice questions um, to promote retention. Why do we do it this way? So as you can see, this is Evan House's forgetting curve. Um, by the time I'm done, you'll already have forgotten half of what I said. <laughs> An hour, you know, luckily it, it slows down like any of these curves. And at an hour, you're still remembering a little less than half. By tomorrow, a third. And if you remember a quarter of this in a week, 
you're doing pretty good. Uh, no f kind of f conflicts of interest. If you want the slides, happy to share the slides. Um, so we'll start off first case. You're the attending hearing about a holdover admission from Nightfoot. She describes an 83 year old woman with a history of COPD who presented with two days of shortness of breath and then an acute syncopal episode. She describes mild shortness of breath and cough and then syncopized when walking to the bathroom at home. On exam, tachycardic, hypoxic. She had diffuse wheezing, was alert and oriented. Her white blood cell count was normal and her chest x-ray was clear. Nightfoot states she thinks this is an acute COPD exacerbation and describes her plan for antibiotics, corticosteroids, and bronchodilators. She then says she just got a page to the ABG. I don't know if you guys still do ABGs here. We're all about VBGs. I have my own. We could go into a whole literature review on that, but um, they did an ABG. It was 7.33, 5282 on room air. She asks you, in the setting of COPD exacerbation, do you think we should use BiPAP, given that blood gas? How do you respond to her question about the use of BiPAP in this setting? A, I wouldn't usually use it when the pH is, or I'm sorry, I wouldn't we usually use it when the pH is lower. B, we could try, but there isn't great evidence it will help in this setting. Sure, let's try it. D, I was thinking we could just discharge her and have her follow up in her cardiac clinic. Who votes A? B? C? A few for C. D? You guys don't have that here? We're opening one right on 14th Street. You can refer them tomorrow. Um, or E? You throw it back, trying to get you know the, the one-minute model. Do you think we should start by path? Do you concur? So... Um, so what is the benefit of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation over usual care and COPD exacerbations? So Cochrane did a nice meta-analysis, a random, uh, uh, randomized control trials of positive pressure ventilation versus uh, usual care in adults with COPD, standard treatments for COPDs, bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics. They enrolled people with both pHs or they looked at studies primarily for pHs that enrolled people with a pH of less than 7.35 and a PCO2 <laughs> of over 45 on an ABG. They examined, though, does it hold true at both 7.35 and 7.30, or is there really a difference at that cutoff? The results, so they had 17 studies, over 1,200 patients, average age 67-year-old, they rated this as a moderate quality of evidence. Some were really strong. You could tell no bias. When, for those not familiar, Cochrane sort of reviews everything. They have a nice red, yellow, green for levels of bias. Red if they think there was a lot of bias and green if they think none. Moderate is where a lot of things fall when you do these meta-analysis because there's always some bias in some study. Um, so they rated it as moderate quality. Outcomes. Of course, what we all want to know. So, mortality. Wow, that's uh, you know quite something there. Risk ratio 0.54. Confidence intervals, you know, don't even come close to one. So, in mortality, less than 10% of the people are going to die, whereas usual care, 18% were dying. In our in-hospital rate on our service, does that include ICU patients? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so, so they go through it. The studies include people you start it and their ultimate outcome. So in the ED, right. So we use, we don't do BiPAP on the floor and, or we don't initiate BiPAP on the floor and they get to stay on the floor. So if you get BiPAP in the ED, if you don't get off the BiPAP, you're going to the ICU. So yes, it include it, it includes all all we have people. A uh, yeah. Approach here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I know here clinically, a lot of the decisions about bypass some of clinical adherence and the stress there and mm -hmm. mental status, all those things. Do these studies are they purely looking at the numbers or they are many of them using? So these were randomized control trials, and to get into it, you had to meet the. 
criteria of a pH of less than 7.35 and a PCO2 of 45. If you didn't, if you just looked terrible, but your pH was fine, you didn't get, in, you couldn't get enrolled, right? So that was the entry criteria. So <clears throat> what we all also know is that for our average COPD, they may run around with a pH of less than 7.35 and a PCO2 over it. So it's not hard for a lot of them to get into into this trial anyhow. When we look at how you do in terms of whether you wind up intubated or not, 12% uh, who start on BiPAP versus one third of the people who didn't wound up being um, intubated. Pretty strong risk ratio. So yes, this obviously as a, again, the moderate quality, there is some bias and there's a lot of bias in a couple of the studies that still got included. So the results held true for the pH of less than 7.35 as well as 7.30. These numbers above, are the numbers for people was less than 7.35, and there was no significant difference if you looked at a cutoff of 7.30. As you can see, uh, non uh, one uh, mortality and intubation is better, and when you translate these out, obviously, usually you're going to have a much lower length of stay, three days less if you start on BiPAP rather than waiting for them to fail if they're already hypercarbic and with a low pH. Complications were more, a little more, but mild. There is a certain amount of discomfort and um, agitation that goes along with starting BiPAP. So, you know, that was the main complication. So what is the benefit? Right, the conclusion here is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation decreases mortality and intubation versus usual care, may cut length of stay, and it's true for pHs that are 7.35. It was a meta-analysis. It is overall moderate quality. Um, the duration of use was also unclear. So, it, you know, should they be on BiPAP for a day? Should they be on BiPAP as phase point? Like, till they look better. Um, so those were some of the limitations of it. Um, we're probably underusing it based on this data, right? We're probably waiting for people to look bad before starting it. Um, but we, and it, it, the other problem is we don't do ABGs as much anymore to guide our therapy. So that may be it. And we, we should consider it with people that are not as severely acidotic as we may think required. So in the end, the answer C that seemed to be so popular, sure, let's try it, is the one that we recommend it. So the intern calls the bedside nurse and orders the BiPAP, excited about this new evidence-based intervention. The night fluid finishes her presentation, and you ask, so hey, by the way, what do you think about the th syncope? She pauses, rubs her chin, and says, well, I think it's probably orthostasis, but she is short of breath. Do you think we need to worry about PE as a cause for her syncope? So last year when telling you all, you know, we talked about the PESIT trial, all the rage in 2016, 2017, the Italian prospective trial about prevalence of PE in patients hospitalized for syncope. There were a lot of comments about how perhaps the number of 17% that everyone touted maybe was a little bit of an overestimation. Maybe we're picking up things that weren't as important. Um, it was prospective. They used an algorithm and there were some questions about the clinical significance of it all, as well as the number of 17% was only for hospitalized patients without any other clear cut cause. So a very small fraction of our people, but seemed to get a lot more play. Based on this, you had a lot of people who wanted to go out and disprove it. So there was a um, JAMA internal medicine uh, retrospective trial or retrospective in um, emergency medicine, they did a meta-analysis of prevalence of pulmonary embolism in patients presenting with syncope. And then there was another uh, retrospective um, study looking at people over, uh, with the incidence of acute PE following a syncopal event who weren't on anticoagulation, a retrospective cohort study where they looked at three years, you know, from a, a Medicare database, did people actually develop a PE 90 days in three years? 
the other meta-analysis was from four countries and um, looked at really just the following 90 days. Did somebody present with a PE or a VTE in that time frame? So overall, these three studies all came to the same conclusion that the prevalence of PE in setting of syncope is probably closer to 1% to 2% in all takers. Um, they pointed out a lot of the flaws with the prior study. I think, though, that while people are making a big deal of this, one of the things that in the prior study they did acknowledge was that if you included all the people that weren't included this in their statistical analysis, all the people who were discharged or had a clear other cause for syncope, they really did report only about 3% of people that come to an ED with syncope might have a PE. So I don't know if it's as far as the, um, the authors of these three articles wanted to make it seem. Um, in the end, they all still say, you know, if you can't come up with a good cause, maybe you could consider it. These were all retrospective. They may have been missing PEs that were never diagnosed. And if you didn't clinically suspect PE when somebody came to the ED, it's pretty hard to say whether or not they had it if you didn't try and diagnose it. So I think that we probably will see another large trial prospectively looking at this, but um, you know, the, the, the running around saying 17% was probably an overestimation. We all knew that when talking about the article, um, that it was for a very small sub-segment, but these two articles really showed that. So in the end, probably routine evaluation for PE is not warranted, or PE in syncope is not warranted is the take home from that, these three studies, um, just to bring them up. You respond that we probably don't need to think about it, given it was likely orthostatic hypotension based on the history. You ask if orthostatics were performed before she received IV fluid, the night flow says they were borderline positive. She asks, can you clarify how we're supposed to do orthostatics? I've heard different things about how long you should have to wait after the patient stands up. So from JAMA Internal Medicine, there was a really good prospective cohort study of uh, 11,000 patients. I personally no longer think that this is middle-aged, but you know, <laughs> we're gonna, so we're just gonna say patients. Um, so it was, a, it was an interesting study. They checked orthostatic vital signs every 30 seconds um, over five, uh, between uh, using an automated cuff, you just had people stand up and the cuff sort of cycled through. Uh, they got two vital signs before one minute, 30 seconds, and roughly one minute, and then three further ones as you tried to reach the three minute goal for orthostatic vitals. Um, in the end, you know, they, there were, uh, <clears throat> they looked at people. Uh, they, they separated people that sort of presented that were orthostatic within one minute and then those that had a drop of less than five in their systolic and a drop of less than five millimeters of mercury in their diastolic blood pressure. In the two groups that didn't drop their blood pressure, um, there was the dizziness couldn't be correlated to anything. In the people with ortho orthostatic hypotension at 30 seconds or one minute, it was strongly associated with the dizziness that they felt. But it, additionally, both a history and prospective, uh, car crashes, falls, actual syncopal events, fractures relating from the, call cra the car crashes and falls, as well as death. So, um, so really the main point here is, you know, we probably don't need to do three minutes. The later orthostatics actually did not, once you got beyond that, the relative risks actually went down um, if somebody became orthostatic later in the process as opposed to earlier in the process. So probably one minute is enough um, based on this well-designed trial. Knox on it, it was, they did use only sort of quote unquote healthy people. So they weren't people that came in for a car crash or a syncope, they were coming in with less severe complaints of dizziness. You make this teaching point and the night float finishes and leaves to go home and get some sleep. Later that day, you have a chance to review more of the patient's history and see that she has a history of C. diff infection. 
She was in the hospital two weeks ago with broad spectrum antibiotics for pyelonephritis. It is on acid suppression. Based on this, you feel like she's at high risk for C. diff as she is hospitalized and again on antibiotics for the COPD. What can you do to prevent development of C. diff during this patient's hospital stay? Wash your hands with hand gel. Use your own stethoscope, but wash it every time with that little alcohol swab before and after. Start probiotics. Start empiric fidaxomycin. Donate some of your own stool for a fecal <laughs> transplant. So who votes A? No? B? Sounds good, but maybe not. C? No? Fidaxomycin, those, those, those reps got to you yet? <laughs> no? Stools for, uh, for the fecal transplant? No? All right. So what's the role of probiotics in the prevention of C. diff infection? So, again, the wonderful Cochrane people decided to take on this uh, challenge and, and look at it all. They did a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, probiotics versus all other interventions, basically to prevent C. diff. Included any strain of uh, C. diff and any dose of probiotic. There is some risk of bias in a lot of the studies here. So, there were 31 trials with over 8,000 patients. The outcomes, probiotic versus other, pretty good results, right? 1.5% for C. diff infections versus, or C. diff associated diarrhea, not always what we might term an infection. 4%, pretty strong p value. But when you break it down into the trials, what was their estimate of risk for the patients? Low risk, zero to 2%, three to five, versus greater than five. You can see that um, really all of that power is being provided right here by the high risk patients. And that while you see risk ratios that are low, they did cross, uh, they did cross one um, when you look at the confidence intervals and did not reach statistical significance. So, you know, if you have a high-risk patient, it's pretty clear, a little less clear um, in lower-risk groups. So, um, antibiotic-associated diarrhea is less in the probiotics group as well. Adverse events were less in the probiotics group. Detection of C. diff in the stool was the same. Um, some of these, they were just testing all the stool. So if you looked at the sub-segment where they just still tested for colonization, it, it was sort of the same. And they could not figure out if there was any difference between probiotics or the different types of probiotics, whether it was acidophilus or saccharomyces or combination. They, they, there was not enough clarity in the data for that. So the conclusion... Probiotics probably prevent C. diff. The main benefits really in your highest risk patients um, based on their di different characteristics and the, the calculations of risk based on the different studies. There was less diarrhea and fewer side effects overall. There was some risk of bias based on these trials. If you've ever delved into the sort of probiotics and C. diff, they're not always as adherent to blinding in these other issues. Overall, they, they did uh, think that the, the Cochrane review said the quality was probably moderate. So probably prevent C. diff, but you may still want to avoid in some patients who probably shouldn't be getting probiotics, such as immunocompromised or other groups, neutropenic, um, other sorts of people. And then one thing that this didn't sort out was which probiotic, what dose, how, how often, how cost effective is this? Um, so probably, you know, you should work with your, there's also an FDA warning that came out, or not warning, but the FDA um, has put some stipulations around how hospitals should implement this. So if you consider doing it, you should probably start a protocol and work with pharmacy on this. So in the end, start probiotics was the 
answer that we thought for that one. Do you know if any of those trials use like a validated score to estimate C. diff? Because it's five percent to higher risk is probably the target population. Right. Uh, uh, you know, what, are there any scores out there that people are using? I'd have to look back at the exact. You know, again, there were a lot of different trials, so it was a very heterogeneous group. But if, it, um, and and in the in the discussion in the review, they just sort of lump them together. Um, you'd have to we'd have to look at the individual trials for what each one did to estimate it. It may have been physician, it may have been well standardized. Um, but again, with this many trials, there were a lot of different protocols. Again, um, usually it was with, but it was 31 different trials, so there's a certain amount of heterogeneity amongst it all, whether you start day of or day, day after. But most of these trials start at the time because you're trying to prevent an event that you don't know whether it's going to happen or not. So you're really looking at that. So moving on, so you start probiotics, and fortunately she does not develop C. diff on the way home. You make a stool donation to the local stool bank. <laughs> so, you know, definitely recognize PA may not be that common in patients admitted with syncope as we were sort of moving towards last year. Consider using BiPAPs in patients with COPD exacerbation of hypercarbia and use a, a little higher pH than people had initially thought. Checking orthostatic vital signs at one minute versus waiting the full three minutes and then starting probiotics in patients at high risk for C. diff. So again, going back over the forgetting curve, um, why don't we, we will take 30 seconds, pair up, talk to your neighbor, hopefully you know them in this group, and um, <clears throat> say one thing that you think you may actually change tomorrow or the next time you're on service for those that just chose to come in for this talk today, even though you're not on service. <laughs> All right. If I can get everybody to come back. So I'm glad you all met somebody. <clears throat> Hopefully you met somebody you don't talk to as often, but you're probably sitting next to somebody you already talked to frequently. So um, we'll move on for the sake of time because we still have a lot of a lot of great studies to get to. Um, so for our next case, we're going to talk about a 78-year-old man with a history of pancreatic cancer who's had a uh, biliary stent placed, now comes in with fever and right upper quadrant pain. He has severe sepsis based on his vitals and labs. And you're worried about a biliary source. In the ED, you order cultures, IV fluids, antibiotics, all that good stuff. The ED nurse asks you, hey, are you going to give that vitamin C cocktail as well? You ask, what vitamin C cocktail is that? So this is a short take. Um, just to go through it quickly, uh, interesting study published in CHEST last summer, a retrospective before and after study, 94 patients with severe sepsis or, or septic shock, half the patients, the after, um, well, the 37 got usual care. Then they decided to implement this other vitamin C cocktail of hydrocortisone, IV vitamin C, and IV thiamine. at hospital mortality. Not surprisingly, these are septic patients going to an ICU at a tertiary care center that's pretty sick or gets a pretty sick patient population. 40% of them died. Vitamin C cocktail, 8.5% died. SOFA scores decrease faster 
There was less need for renal replacement therapy for AKI in the patients who uh, got the vitamin C cocktail. And there was a shorter duration of vasopressor use um, in that. So real quick, it was a small study. Um, the use of IV vitamin C and IV thiamine comes to some um, ideas about how they uh, help with free radical scavengering. And the idea is you have to give them IV because in severe sepsis, you don't get adequate PO take, uptake, even with a feeding tube or any of these other things, that the, the amount that you need to really cause these effects. It's put forth by uh, a Dr. Barrick, who's obviously the lead author on this. Um, but, you know, it's small data. The, the new group of people did also get steroids. That's, again, back up in, you know, the hot topic. Um, should we be giving septic patients steroids and putting them back on steroids? Should it only be hydrocortisone? Should it be hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone? A lot of different um, reviews this past year of a couple of other articles in that area. So in the end, you decide to say, let's wait for more evidence. He's treated with severe sepsis with usually care and re receives a biliary stent replacement. On hospital day two, his blood cultures return positive for E. coli, his fissures resolve, and his vital signs are stabilized. The following morning, you wonder, do you need to order repeat cultures to make sure that E. coli is gone? So do we need repeat cult blood cultures in gram-negative rod bacteremia? Yes, definitely. Yes, but only after confirming that the initial culture is not a contaminant. Probably not under most circumstances. No, never. And um, then E, gram-negative rods make me weary, so find the answer. I'm going to ask Siri. Who votes A? It's probably what we usually do. Um, I know that that's what I've been doing. B, C? People are going to guess with that one because it's sort of hedging and they're not sure and it's an update so they think they're going to hear something new. No, never. They think that they would have heard that. And asking Siri, my favorite. No? So what's the value of follow-up uh, blood cultures in gram-negative bacteremia? This article in Clinical Infectious Disease last summer it was a retrospective analysis. 500 patients with true bacteremia examined this so they did a chart review they looked at follow-up blood cultures and predict predictors of pers uh, persistent bacteremia the results there were 383 patients that had follow-up blood cultures which already sort of tells you that not everyone's getting follow-up blood cultures out of the 500 37 percent of the patients with bacteremia who got follow-up blood cultures had gram-negative bacteremia so all patients, 14% of people had repeat blood cultures that were positive. All patients, gram positives and gram negatives. Gram positive coccides, this includes all your staphs, all your streps. Enterococci, if you're having problems with that as well. So that makes up a large percentage of that 14%. You know, one out of five patients will have positive repeat cultures. But for gram-negative rods, only 5%, five, 6%, five, percent, five, six percent, 8 out of 140 had it. Um, the one predictive factor they could find was that, you know, if you were having repeat fevers, that predicted that you were probably going to be, you were more likely to be positive on your repeat blood cultures. One of the drawbacks was that not all the follow-up blood cultures were done at fever spikes. A lot of them were done as surveillance or just to see if they were clearing. So our conclusion on this was follow-up cultures are pretty uh, common for gram-negative bacteremia, but they're very low yield. Um, and fever at the time is more predictive, so maybe you want to wait for fevers and, and hold off if they don't have it. Comments, it was retrospective single center, and the indications for the initial as well as the follow-ups were a little unclear. So, again, in general, we're saying don't repeat the blood cultures. 
consider if persistent fever or a lack of source control, right? So that was one of the other great things. We knew where it was coming from and we fixed where it was coming from. So, so we're saying C, as most of you guys went with, um, probably not under most circumstances. So you decide not to repeat the blood cultures as he is a febrile and improving. He's been in ertapenem, and you note that the E. coli is pan-sensitive. You pause and think about narrowing the antibiotics. Specifically, you wonder if you can change to an oral antibiotic to treat the gram-negative rod bacteremia. So this was uh, published in February ahead of print. I don't know if it's um, come out yet. Uh, oral antibiotics and bacteremia. So the IBSA put out a choosing wisely guideline that says we should use bioavailable agents or we should try and use highly bioavailable oral agents whenever possible. So the, this group went and they, they took a look. They found in their literature review that they only had enough for a narrative review. There was not enough data for a systematic or meta-analysis. Um, and what they found is that, you know, switching to oral agents or oral antibiotics for different types of uh, bacteria depends on what you're treating. Um, you know, for, for all staffs, two weeks of IV treatment is indicated no matter what, um, just because of the virulence of the bug, the risks of developing endocarditis, as well as other things. Um, and there's no, no one's ever looked at trying to treat uh, bacteremia for MSSA or MRSA with oral agents. For strep pneumonia, as many of us do, you know, it's probably safe. Right? How many of you still convert to an oral agent, even if the person with pneumonia had bacteremia? Right? At a, there, we may repeat it and see if it's gone. And if it's cleared, you may choose to finish out your um, your course of antibiotics with oral. Because the gram-negative rods, probably safe. The biggest um, the biggest uh, caveat to all of this is that you have to have source control. With most of our gram-negative rods, we know where the sources are. They're usually GI or GU. So as long as you know that the, you've gotten good source control, if the person had urinary obstruction from the UTI and you relieve the obstruction, you change a biliary stent, you remove a gallbladder, whatever it is, um, you're probably okay once you've gotten good source control. So you switch to an oral fluoroquinolone. On hospital day four, you arrive to learn that he developed a fever to 101.3 degrees overnight. His other vital signs were in normal range and he felt fine. During the sign up, the nocturnist says, since the patient didn't have shaking chills and ate all of his dinner, I didn't order repeat cultures. Pause, hmm, interesting. Is there some new study I should know about? Well, yes, there was blood culture yield. So this is a great study uh, out of a hospital in Tokyo, Japan, uh, from last summer. Uh, prospective multi-center observational cohort study, almost 2,000 patients who had blood cultures drawn for any reason were followed. What were they looked for? Um, they, we looked at poor food consumption and shaking chills. For that group, the incidence of true bacteremia was almost half. In patients with normal food consumption, so to go back, I'm sorry, I thought that it was on here, but <clears throat> I may have removed that part. <clears throat> they, they looked at it at all the patients. Poor food consumption was defined by less than 80% of your tray in the meal prior to your fever spike. This was confirmed by two nurses who each independently verified using a checklist whether or not you did this. Yeah. So it was pretty labor intensive and it was always the meal before. So this would have been dinner, right? You don't look, if you spike a fever at 630 and you eat all your breakfast, you still were looking at dinner to see whether it was predictive or not. How did you feel before? Um, and shaking chills is shaking chills. So if you had both of those, the incidence was half. If you had normal food consumption and no shaking chills, the incidence of true bacteremia was 2.5%, roughly. Normal food consumption alone, 
had a negative likelihood ratio of 0.18 with a confidence interval of 0.17 to 0.19 for true bacteremia. So I think we can take that as a pretty strong indicator. The presence of shaking chills had a positive likelihood ratio of almost five with a confidence interval of four and a half to five for true bacteremia. So, um, you know, you should probably think about these things. Um, you know, I think we all have known for a long time shaking chills is, is probably the best time to culture somebody and has been very often looked at historically as one of the best predictors. But this normal food consumption is, looks like it's a pretty good negative predictor for recurrent bacteremia. So his fever resolves without explanation. Unfortunately, the following day, the patient complains of new right leg swelling. An ultrasound shows a new DVT. He started on low molecular weight heparin. A day later, you are preparing for discharge and deciding how to treat his DVT. In the setting, remember he has active cancer. What treatment do you prescribe? Warfarin, because you can check a number, and therefore you know where they are. And he's squirming, cringing at that idea. <laughs> Low molecular weight heparin. It's a shot, but we know. IVC filter plus low molecular weight heparin. A new oral anticoagulant, such as adoxaban. Or daily right massage, because you're just going to squeeze it out. <laughs> Who votes A? No takers. Nobody wants to send them to Coumadin Clinic. Uh, low molecular weight heparin, which is what I think most of us have done. IVC filter plus heparin. Anybody likes the Greenfield Company? Um, a new oral anticoagulant. Some early adopters, maybe. And nobody for E? Okay. So which is better, adoxaban or daltaparin for VTE? So this was a randomized open label non-inferiority trial that many of you may have seen was in the New England Journal this past uh, March, February or March, um, for patients with acute symptomatic or incidental DVT or PE. So they used adoxaban versus daltaparin for Months. Treatment beyond the six months was at the physician discretion. They did a total of 1,046 a, a patients. They used a modified intention to treat analysis. So when you looked at the outcomes, uh, the major outcome of compo uh, composite recurrent VTE or major GI bleed, they met their threshold. It was primarily a non-inferiority trial, so they met it with a pretty strong p-value. Uh, um, 67 versus 71 issues. Recurrent VTE, we see a lot less. This was a secondary outcome. This was pre measured primarily up to um, the six month mark and a lot of the secondaries were beyond that, which becomes important when we talk about things such as the major GI bleeding secondary. You're wondering why is it, it, it's these numbers for all these recurrent VTE and major GI bleeding don't exactly add up um, because uh, they were looking primarily a little farther out and did some censoring of it all. And then non-major GI bleeding, um, again, adoxaban had a lot more non-major GI bleeding. So there was a, a lot of, uh, you can see there's an increase in non-fatal bleeding in adoxaban, but it was offset by the decrease in VTE. Um, adoxaban, and when we get to the conclusions, I'm going to get into why that was. Adoxaban was non inferior to daltaparin. Adoxaban increased bleeding less than VTE, um, increased bleeding but had less VTE. It was a well done randomized control trial. Before we start knocking it for being open labeled, non inferiority, um, not giving people sham shots and all these other things. Um, this was exactly the same type of trial that low molecular weight heparin used to supplant warfarin in the early 2000s. Um, and actually the same medication because despite the fact that we all use um, anoxaparin, it was actually daltaparin that was in that original trial. Um, so 
the reason that a lot of those secondary outcomes of non-fatal GI bleeding really went up, as well as perhaps some of the reason that people um, had more VTE, uh, particularly in the secondary outcomes for uh, low molecular weight heparin was people stayed on the adoxaban longer. Pretty much, if you looked at the average time that people took the Zoltaparin, it was like six months in a day. Whereas uh, with the Adoxaban, people went out nine, 12 months. So you saw a lot more of these uh, other effects. Um, when we did this one, actually, for our journal club, our anticoagulation expert called them nuisance bleeds, you know, because they pre they're preventing a potentially fatal event, but they're non-fatal in themselves. Yes. I don't recall if the if they if it was specifically in people with GI cancers. I think there was a large amount of just GI sort of oozing. They were non free. It may have been. I don't recall. So, but it's a great point. It, you may want to yes. But I think that was in both groups, if, if, if so. Um, so the stance on all this, adopting it, I, I think, <clears throat> is going to come down to who you're working with. Um, you're going to find there are people that are going to be early adopters and not early adopters. I think that we have to work in conjunction with our oncology colleagues around this um, because you know, their voice is going to ring very loudly in, in the patient's ears. Yeah. Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I've known about this trial. Uh, I, I think it's fairly impressive. I think Alfred summarized it really well. I would, and plus, you're boarding a shot. And you know, in patients right. with cancer, you know, you can, it's actually a more kinder, uh, easier yeah. treatment, which is, which is not trivial either. So uh, I kind of agree with the conclusion you're preventing a potential fatal, serious condition. And, most of the bleeds are not. Well, except for it's not only one trial because all the other companies have their own smaller trials, and the River Oxaban people, my understanding, is presented at ASH or ASCO or one of them in December of last year. Their early results, Adoxaban just beat them to the major publication. So the others have been showing. Um, either have ongoing trials or have preliminary results of trials that they're in the writing up phase, um, showing similar results um, about it all. So it's not only one trial. It's, and it's, it's spanning across the, um, it's probably going to be a class issue. It's not going to be a specific one agent versus the other. How Uh, one of the problems is in this marketplace, because we've tried to put some people on it, not for this, but for um, the Doxaban, oddly enough, also has a niche that it doesn't interact with a lot of the antiretrovirals the same way Apixaban and, um, and uh, Rivaroxaban do. There are certain, um, I, th I forget if it was protease inhibitors, if it was an NRTI, they, you just can't give them. So you're stuck either using an older anticoagulant or, or not for some of the patients. Doxaban does not have that because of its molecular structure. It avoids this one thing. So you do usually need to get prior or approval. It's not on anyone's like preferred list, they, right? You, you, you may you have to figure out whether they'll pay for rivaroxaban or apixaban, but that's a pretty easy call to the pharmacy. If you're getting to doxaban, you do have to start to deal with the insurance companies. So we said, because when we were doing it, we, you know, low molecular weight is still the sort of pushed choice. Um, the newer uh, oral anticoagulants probably will supplant it in the next couple of years, but we'll see how quick people are to adopt this. I think as more and more trials come, up, come out across the board, we'll see more and more adoption of it because, again, the results, the, the negative results can also be interpreted in that it was because people were taking their anticoagulant versus stopping at six days, six months in a day. 
So you decide to go with a low molecular weight heparin, but realize if there are contraindications or insurance issues, you might be okay to do a NOAC. Um, discharge safely on his oral anticoagulant and treatment for his VTE. So consider the new vitamin C cocktail. Uh, not routinely follow up, getting follow-up blood cultures for gram-negative bacteremia. Oral, oral antibiotics could be used to treat gram-negative rod bacteremia. Deferring blood cultures if the patient is eating well and without rigors. And soon we may be switching how we treat VTE in cancer patients. Again, I will provide uh, Andrew the, all the slides to, to send. So, right. We can get through the, the last case in, in a few. There just won't be any quite time for questions for those who can stay. Um, so, a 66-year-old woman presented ED, fevers, chill, shortness of breath, severely hypoxic, respiratory therapist placed her on 40 liters. I think this is probably the most important article for people to see about high-flow nasal cannula. The respiratory therapist asks, hey, how do... Do you know of any evidence supporting the use of high-flow nasal cannula compared with other methods of oxygen delivery? So real quick, a whole bunch of questions about high-flow versus others. Um, just for those who don't know what high-flow is, it's heated, humidified oxygen delivered at rates of up to 60 liters a minute. Benefits patient comfort, mobilized secretions, decrease entrapment of room air, wash out of dead space, PEEP, and it delivers 100% FiO2. Again, a meta-analysis and systematic review, 18 studies, almost 4,000 patients, hypoxic respiratory failure. Um, there were randomized controlled trials, prospective and retrospective trials included, compared high-flow nasal cannula versus usual oxygen therapy or BiPAP. Goal was O2 sat of greater than 92%. Medical and surgical causes of respiratory failure were considered. No evidence of publication bias, just to real quick get to it all. If you take a look against oxygen, it really prevents intubations. Against uh, BiPAP, you know, it crosses one. Looks like maybe it's a little better, but uh, you can't be certain of that given the confidence intervals. And even ICU mortality against oxygen alone, it's, it, it's not um, statistically significant. So uh, reintubation on people that were intubated and then got high flow. It was much better than um, oxygen alone, but not better than positive pressure. And there was no data on patient comfort. So real quick, there was a lot of statistical heterogeneity. There were many causes, better than usual oxygen delivery, no worse than BiPAP, and it's certainly a lot more comfortable. So it can be started as first line for patients with hypoxic respiratory failure. She gets it. Uh, and then just one of last study, hey, is this your first year as a hospitalist? You reply, yes. So many of you may have seen this for JAMA from last year, a large retrospective pro study on a Medicare database. First versus second year and versus beyond. Hospitalists in their first year had a higher in-hospital mortality and 30-day mortality. Um, but there was no change after your second year. So for those of you that are second years, you're over the hump. Um, no worries. You're as good as everybody else. Don't let Eric tell you differently. Um, so you, you chuckle, walk slowly off to ask about uh, current faculty development, which Andrew's still here to answer your questions about. Um, so you go back. You need to finish. Um, and this was a nice trial about... Uh, giving empathic st statements, prospective, um, qualitative, quantitative. Uh, they recorded empathic responses to negative emotions. And again, um, it showed that giving empathic statements makes people feel better and will improve your HCAP scores. So oh, this was a smart, uh, this was a, a quick study on a, if people are using their smartphone on a surgical unit, for those of you doing co-management, send them home. So, so that's 